Just before we start, a big shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. This is what our galaxy looks like and where we are in it, or so we are told, because this is a side on view from what would be maybe half a million light years away. Now clearly we have a problem here because the farthest man-made object capable of taking such an image is Voyager 1, which is currently after 44 years of traveling through space, is now over 23 billion kilometers from Earth. Sounds like a lot, but it's actually only 0.002 light years. It will take Voyager another 17,700 years or so to reach just one light year from Earth. So considering that we are deep inside the Milky Way, how do we know what it looks like from the outside? And where are we in it? It's been said that trying to know what our galaxy looks like and where we fit into it amongst the other 100 billion or so other stars is like trying to work out the shape of a massive forest whilst being tied to one of the trees. All the images we see of our Milky Way from a distance are just an artist's impression or a computer simulation. But we must have some solid evidence from which to make such images. We can get some clues as to the general structure by just looking up at the night sky. Firstly, we can see a fairly narrow band of bright hazy stars that circles the sky, the thing we call the Milky Way, which indicates that we are in a flattened disk of stars and not in a sphere, because if that were the case, we would see many more stars more equally distributed in every direction. Also, because the band of stars bisects the sky, we must be in the plane of a disk and not offset above it or below it. The first person to try and map the sky was the British astronomer William Herschel in the late 18th century. He did this by counting the number of stars, and whilst this produced a rough map of the heavens, what he didn't know was the distance to those stars, and that wouldn't be known accurately for another 120 years or so. He came to the conclusion that we live in the centre of a grindstone-shaped galaxy. However, he was not aware of the dust particles that block visible light from the farthest parts of the Milky Way, so he was not able to see the full picture. Up until about 100 years ago, it was thought by many astronomers that everything we saw in the night sky was the entirety of the universe, and made up of stars, dust and gas, and things like nebula, and what we now know are galaxies. And these were all within the Milky Way. Effectively, the Milky Way was the universe. But some astronomers questioned that idea, because with the increasing power of telescopes, it allowed them to study faint patches of light or nebula that could be seen in the night sky in greater detail. Initially, these had only been thought of as areas of gas where new stars formed, but others believed they were completely separate and contained a huge number of stars and were at a great distance from Earth. Problem was, we didn't have an accurate method of working out the distance to the stars or other objects in the night sky. Stars vary greatly in both size and brightness, and one of the main ways we could assume their distance was how bright or dim they appeared. The issue here is that a large bright star at a great distance could look similar to a dimmer, smaller star closer to home. In 1908, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, an American astronomer, was working on cataloguing the brightness of variable stars in the small and large Magellanic clouds, which are satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. She catalogued 1,777 Cepheid variable stars recorded on photographic plates taken at known time intervals. These variable stars are so called because their brightness cycles up and down over a period of time ranging from days to months. What she noticed was that the brighter these variable stars were, the longer their time period of varying brightness would be. On studying the 1,777 Cepheid variables, she was able to draw an almost straight line that linked the fastest periods to the dimmest stars and the slowest periods to the brightest stars. Once this was known, astronomers had what is now called a standard candle. 
namely stars with a known brightness from which they could work out the distance from Earth by how bright they were. And this allowed astronomers to measure distances of up to 20 million light years, far greater than anything before. When Edwin Hubble discovered a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda Nebula in 1924, it proved that it was a completely separate entity from the Milky Way and at a distance of some 2.5 million light years and itself was a large galaxy in its own right and therefore the universe was much bigger than just the Milky Way. This had been suggested as far back as 1775 but few had believed in the idea. So if Andromeda was a galaxy in the shape of a flattened disk of stars then maybe our galaxy could be similar but where are we in it? One of the people who originally believed that everything we saw was in the Milky Way was Harlow Shapley. Early in his career, he'd realized that the Milky Way galaxy was far bigger than previously believed. Between 1914 and 1918, Shapley measured the distance to globular clusters, tightly packed clusters of stars, usually containing several hundred thousand stars, but much more closely packed than the rest of the galaxy. If we were in the center of a globular cluster, the nearest star to our sun, Proxima Centauri, would be 13 times closer at just a third of a light year. Shapley found that these globular clusters were spherically distributed around the galactic core and determined that the core of the Milky Way was in the constellation of Sagittarius. From this, he deduced that the center of the Milky Way has a spherical bulge, and that the Earth was some way from it. He actually overestimated the distance at between 33 and 98,000 light years from the center, which we now know to be 28,000 light years. He believed that the Milky Way was very much larger than we thought, but everything we saw was a part of it, including things like the Andromeda Nebula. But after Hubble's evidence conclusively proved that wrong, he became a convert, and between 1925 and 1932, went on to map 76,000 galaxies and was one of the first to believe in galaxy superclusters, discovering one that is now called the Shapley supercluster. One of the main methods he used to determine the distance to stars was parallax, which is similar to the way in which we use our two eyes to see a 3D image of the world and give us the ability to perceive depth and distance of an object. Because the stars in the night sky are so far away, our normal stereoscopic vision doesn't work here. Our eyes are just too close together. For that, we need the ability to take two images separated by millions of kilometers. By using the position of the Earth as it orbits the sun, we can take images of the night sky up to 300 million kilometers apart as the Earth travels from one side of the sun to the other. At these distances, we can see the difference in the position of the target star relative to the stars in the background, but are much farther away. Then using basic trigonometry, the distance to the star can be calculated. However, this only works for stars that are relatively nearby, up to about 3,200 light years, just over a tenth of the distance to the galactic core. Beyond that, the parallax angle becomes too small to measure accurately with current technology. To measure the distance to the globular clusters, which were much further away, was done by using the whole cluster instead of just a few stars inside, and knowing that they are very compact structures. One of the main things that hampered the measurement using ordinary stars in the galactic plane was that most are hidden from view by the dust that lies in the space between the stars. The globular clusters are outside of the galactic disk and therefore not affected by this dust, and are much easier to see at a distance. It's now thought that nearly all spiral galaxies like the Milky Way have a galactic bulge at the center and have globular clusters surrounding it in a halo. With the advent of more advanced infrared photography, we are now able to see through much of the dust and have been able for the first time to photograph things like the supermassive black hole at the center of the galactic bulge. Using this method, we can see more ordinary stars to get better results. And by combining all the previous methods, including mapping billions of stars in the night sky, and then remapping them months or years later, we can see the natural movement of the stars and extrapolate the distances from this data 
and quite accurately build up a map of the Milky Way and where we are in it, all without moving farther than the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So those pictures of the Milky Way from the outside are pretty accurate, and as time goes by will become more accurate as we gather more data. And maybe one day, in the far distant future, we'll be able to take a selfie of the Milky Way from the outside when we've developed faster than light travel. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Now, whilst we won't be seeing any faster than light travel for a considerable time, if ever, according to some, one thing that you can do quickly from the comfort of your own chair is to get a website up and running with Squarespace. With Squarespace, you can have a beautiful looking website to grow your business or blog or any other kind of online presence. If you're looking to generate an income from your website, you can do that through gated members only content. Manage your members, send email communications, and connect with your social media accounts to push your website content to them and spread the word via your followers, all in one easy to use platform. If you're looking to create a community with your website, you can use their powerful included blogging tools to categorize, schedule, and share posts and build interaction with their fully integrated commenting system. And managing an online store is even easier with their new third-party tools to manage inventory, promote products, track your sales, and handle tax and shipping around the world. All you need to do to get started is to go to squarespace.com for a free trial. Then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash curious droid to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain.